Hey, it's Jim on a beautiful midday on a Sunday, and this is level three of the CFA program, the topic on fixed income portfolio management, and the reading on liability-driven and index-based strategies. And once again, we've divided our slide deck and this reading into two parts. So we'll focus on uh, liability-driven investing and the four, first four LOSs of this reading. And then in part two, we'll go ahead and uh, finish the rest of them. Let me just quickly remind you that in the previous reading, which was called an overview of fixed income portfolio management, we talked about duration and interest rate risk and convexity and maybe mandates. And so it was really an introductory chapter. Now what we're doing is we're going to go ahead and apply those concepts that we learned in the previous reading to a strategy. So from my perspective, the key word in uh, the reading title is, uh, is strategies. So let me give you just a quick example. Let's suppose that we're an individual or a business or even a government, government for that matter. And let's suppose that we have a liability that's due a year from now and the value of that liability is going to be $100. What we want to do is we want to finance that with something over on the left hand side of our balance sheet. So let's suppose that we buy a bond. After all, what do we buy bonds for? We buy them for their income and their capital gains, just like we, we buy lots of other securities. So let's suppose that that bond sells for $96 today. So we buy that bond. It's a zero coupon bond and it matures in one year for $100. So what happens a year from now, we have uh, this liability that's coming due for 100 and our bond pays off for 100. Uh, this is really the essence of uh, asset liability management and the liability driven strategy and the index based strategy. What we're just doing is looking at the balance sheet in its entirety, right? Comparing the right and left hand side so that we can fund our future obligations. Now, you might be tempted to say something like, you know what, Jim, that was a really good example. We don't really have to listen to the rest of your slide deck. However, let me go ahead and point out to you that there are some subtleties that we need to be aware of. And so we'll do four of them in the first LOSs. And then in part two, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, tackle the re remaining five. So we need to worry about single liabilities. We need to worry about multiple liabilities and we need to worry about bond portfolios. Let's do a quick recap of what we learned back in level two and probably what we learned in, you know, maybe some other parts of our life. Uh, this is what you need to know. This big topic called asset liability liability management is exactly what I was describing just a few moments ago. We're looking at both the assets and the liabilities and to see how they relate to each other. What we need to know is what kind of sensitivity to yield changes are those liabilities and then try to match them over on the left hand side. So asset liability management strategies are, are kind of the general term for everything that we're going to do inside of this reading. We get a little bit more specific with liability driven and asset driven investing. And all that suggests is that, that the driver is on either the right hand side of the balance sheet or the left hand side of the balance sheet. Now, uh, Liability-driven investing is just one part of an ALM strategy, but what I want you to do is focus on, for LDI, focused on things like cash flows. What are those cash flows that we have as part of our obligations and how can we match those over on the left-hand side of the balance sheet? So LDI, of course, was initiated because of uh, pension fund managers need to fund those future obligations. Notice in the purple there, we have pensions and insurance portfolios there. Now we do know about index-based investment strategies. You know, the CFA Institute does lots and lots of stuff for uh, passive investing and index-based strategies, mostly with equity securities, but we'll just apply all that material that we learned under passive equity investment and apply it to the fixed income world. Notice we have some bolded words down there at the bottom, diversification, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, 
<laughs> but there are some problems here in that, you know, the equity market might look like this. The fixed income market might look like this. So there's a greater challenge, you know, breadth and depth of the bond markets to kind of to kind of derive some type of an index based or a passive strategy. All right, let's start with that first uh, LOS, describe liability driven investing. All right, this is what I was saying earlier, right? A special case of ALM where the liabilities are given, right? Think of, think of a pension fund. Pension fund manager has to wake up every day and he or she says to him or herself something like, well, you know what? I have these retired employees who I have to pay today and next week and next month and 10 years from now and 100 years from now. Well, maybe not 100 years from now because retired employees probably don't live for another 100 years. But you get my point that you got to work for that long term. In addition, I have all these current employees who are going to retire someday soon. So I need to make adjustments in my portfolio so that I have enough capital to pay them today and next week and next month and 100 years from now. So what we're doing is we're going to take those liabilities as a given and then we're going to figure out what to do on the left hand side of the balance sheet. And remember, the focus has to be on both duration and convexity. You know, the idea is to say something like, now this is really a general comment here, that if our liabilities have a weighted average duration of, let's say, five, and a convexity, let's say, of 100, that we go out and find bonds that have durations of five and convexities of 100, so that, well, look at the last part of that lower left box to offset interest rate risk. Now, of course, we can ask the question not only from the pension fund or the insurance company example, but individual investors, institutional investors, is that those liabilities over there on the right hand side of the balance sheet, I mean, they just arise from just, you know, regular old decisions. I mean, think about me, I'm a, I'm a 61 year old college professor, and it might be that I might say something like, you know what, I want to build a a uh, $100,000 swimming pool in my backyard for my children and my grandchildren. And I want to do it when I retire, when I'm 71. You know, so there's a future obligation. And I know that there is sensitivity on the pricing of future construction costs and swimming pool costs, et cetera, et cetera. And so construction costs, those are sensitive to liabilities, right? They're sensitive to interest rates. Uh, if interest rates go way up, then, you know, my constructing company is going to say, you know what, the cost of lumber goes way up and I had to borrow to buy that lumber and I'm going to pass along that expense to you. So you get the sense that, you know, this rate sensitive liability portfolio, I mean, it's absolutely uh, applied to pension funds, but it can be applied to individual investors and, and of course, institutional investors as well. So that third column there, that tells us just exactly what I'm saying, um, but also individuals way over on the far right. Purchasing an annuity at retirement, that's way more dull than uh, building a swimming pool in the backyard. When I saw this, uh, when I saw this in the reading, I immediately went back in time to, uh, you know, 20 years or so ago. Do you guys remember a dude named Donald Rumsfeld who, you know, was some super important guy when we, uh, when the United States had some conflict uh, overseas? And he was the first person who I ever heard say something like, okay, we're going to, uh, you know, have this, uh, have this military uh, exercise. And there's some things that we know and some things that we don't know. And there are some things that we don't know that we don't know. And uh, uh, Donald was kind of remembered for that comment here. And it applies to what we're doing here. So I would memorize these and probably get your phone out and take a picture of this slide type one, two, three, and four. So this comes directly out of the reading. So I would know the type one through four. So the first one is easy. Known amount of cash flows and known timing. Examples are uh, fixed rate bonds. So, you know, you have a 10% coupon, so you get $100 every year or $50 every six months if it's a semi-annual bond. And it has to be option free so that when it matures in five or 10 or 50 years, you know, you know what those cash flows are going to be and you know the timing of those 
cash flows as well. But then if you throw some embedded option in there, like a call feature or a put feature, then the timing of the cash flows is unknown or uncertain. That's the term that the reading uses. And then the amount of the cash flows is known. But then if you take away the uh, embedded option, you still have some uncertainty in there with a floating rate bond or those bonds that are tied to some kind of an index return. So a lot of them are tied to inflation. So the amount of the cash flows is uncertain. I always tell my students, I always do this. I say, look, with a fixed rate bond, you go like this. <laughs> you know, it's fixed rate, right? A fixed coupon rate with a floating rate bond, that floating rate that floating coupon payment can go up or it can go down. And then, of course, the insurance companies and the pension funds that we've talked about, you know, the amount of the cash flows, that's pretty much uncertain. And the timing of the cash flows, I mean, there's some relative certainty in there, but there's still, there's, you, can't, you can't pin it down. You don't know exactly, um, you don't know exactly when the property or the casualty is going to occur. You know, who knows when a fire is going to happen? Who knows when people are going to retire early or when those retired employees are, are going to pass away? Now, another table to uh, go just a little bit deeper into that previous slide. So those type one cash flows, the size of the cash flows are known and the timing is known. So how do we measure that uncertainty? Well, we know this, we, we use duration and we can go all the way back to uh, uh, Macaulay who developed his duration formula. My gosh, it's almost a hundred years by now. I think the year was 1938. And that was really rev revolutionary for this dude to come up with this measure of interest rate sensitivity. And you might remember from, you know, maybe my level one or level two videos, or maybe your professors in college called this Macaulay duration is pretty much just a weighted average time to maturity. And I, I have my students uh, do this in an Excel spreadsheet so they can actually compute it using Excel and at the bottom right they do some division and there there comes up the duration and they can actually see that oh yeah Jim that makes sense it's a weighted average time to maturity. But then one of the really cool things that came about sometime in the late 60s maybe early 70s is this concept of a modified duration where you can just divide Macaulay by one plus the yield to maturity and you get a measure to be able to determine the new price of a bond if the yield changes. Now, I'm going to go ahead and hold up my uh, my calculator. Here's uh, here's one that I use in school. I don't have my 12C. I may have left that in school. But, you know, we can calculate the new price of a bond using just our five time value of money buttons. But I always tell my students and I, I wait until they get to me in the second class in the investments class. I don't tell them this in my first corporate finance class. But using those five time value of money buttons, that's kind of like a kindergarten model to come up with a with a bond price. I mean, there's lots and lots of assumptions in there about the timing of the cash flows. So what these pension fund managers did in, you know, somewhere around 1970 is they said, you know what, we can use duration if we modify it to be able to come up with a much more accurate price than using that kindergarten model from the financial calculator. And in fact, it's way easier than using spot rates or forward rates. Remember, we did all that stuff back in, uh, in level two. So that modification really saves us a lot of time. And then, of course, we can just relate it to dollars instead of duration being, you know, some measure of years. We can rate it to dollar, uh, relate it to dollars. We call that money duration or dollar duration and then the present value of a basis point. So those are the type one cash flows focuses on duration. Now, what we're going to do with the types two, three and four liabilities. Uh, Remember, there was uh, embedded options, there were floating rates, there were pension funds, there were insurance companies. So we need to introduce this concept of effective duration, which you learned back in level two, effective duration measures interest rate sensitivity, considering that embedded option or the floating rate or any of those other kinds of extra things. So think on the left hand column. This is a simple way of looking at those type one cash flows. And it's simple because duration and money duration, th those are simple concepts. But now over here, we need to worry about uncertainty in both the timing 
and size of those cash flows. So remember, regular old duration for type one cash flows and effective duration for types two, three, and four uh, liabilities. Now, remember my very first example about the $100 liability and the $96 bond that was gonna mature for $100. What I was telling you essentially was that that liability was immunized. And that concept of immunization just means that we're matching the assets over here, the bond that we own over here versus the liability over on the right hand side of the balance sheet. And so look at that definition there, structuring and managing fixed income bonds to match the cash flows on the right hand side of the balance sheet. But a lot of times you're not going to be able to exactly match, even with changes in amounts and notional if we're using some kind of a derivative. So what we tr what we want to do is, boy, do you remember this concept from equity stuff? We talked about minimizing tracking error. Well, that's kind of a similar concept here. Notice what we have bolded. We want to minimize the variance of that realized return. And that dip, that variance is going to be based on, you know, interest rates, you know, the yields go up and down. Now with a single liability, like in my $100 example, it can be perfectly immunized by buying a zero coupon bond with the same maturity as the liability. This is exactly what my example uh, suggested earlier. Now, the problem then arises if, if we have a bond that pays coupons, then we have to balance price risk and reinvestment risk. So what do we do? Let's just go back to our uh, reading from uh, the last slide deck. What do we call that? An overview of fixed income management. What do we know? We have this bond portfolio. So we have a bunch of bonds. They all pay interest every six months. And so we might have a bond that pays interest in a month. We might have another bond that pays interest in two months, another bond that pays interest in three, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have these liabilities over here. And so we may or may not have to pay interest on those liabilities, but you can see that the timing issue is a problem. So what do we do when we own this bond portfolio? Every time we get a coupon payment, we reinvest it. If interest rates go up, that's good news because we can reinvest at a higher rate. However, however, if yields go up, if interest rates go up, and for some reason we need to sell the bond, then we suffer because the price of that bond falls. So do you see the purple over here and the red over here? These are costs and benefits of owning a bond portfolio. Uh, but immunization means that those costs and benefits are exactly canceled out. Hmm. So think about what that means, that when interest rates rise, that's good news because we can reinvest the coupons at the higher rate. Let's suppose that good news is this amount right here. Can you guys see the, the length of the distance between my thumb and finger? Well, if yields rise, then our bond is going to fall in value. That's bad news. So how about the bad news is this? I noticed when I went away from the camera, I didn't move the distance between my thumb and finger. So what are we doing? We're exactly offsetting the good news and the bad news associated with our owning this bond portfolio. That's what immunization is. So how do we do this? Well, we try to match durations and convexities of both sides of the balance sheet. And we'll talk about that as we go through not just this slide deck, but then uh, part two as well. Those are some of the subtleties that I was describing in the very beginning. So let's take a step backwards and say, what, what about zero coupon bonds? There, there's no reinvestment rate risk because there are no coupons. There are no coupons to reinvest. Huh, that makes perfect sense. And if we hold that bond until it matures, we know that there is no price risk. Wow, that's a really cool concept. Now, if we're forced to sell that zero coupon bond before maturity, then there probably is some price risk. But if we hold it to maturity, like in my example of the $96 that matured for $100 in that very first example. However, what we know is that there are not a million zero coupon bonds out there. Most bonds pay either a fixed or a floating uh, coupon rate. Uh, 
So how are we going to perfectly immunize a portfolio if there are not zero coupon bonds that are out there? Well, that's of course what we're doing in the remainder of this thing. But this slide here just tells us how to immunize for a single liability. And that involves just structuring and managing exactly what I said in, the, uh, uh, in my first example. How do we do this? Look in between the two greater than signs. We have a Macaulay duration that matches the liability's maturity date. So with this single liability, if we have a liability, let's go back to my example. What did I say? When I was 71, I wanted to buy $100,000 worth of a swimming pool in my backyard. Well, what I can do is I can just go out and buy a bond, a zero coupon bond that matures in 10 years. And maybe I'll buy that bond today for, oh boy, I could get my calculator out and do some quick math, but let's just suppose I buy it for $80,000 today. What am I doing? I'm financing the purchase of my future obligation of a swimming pool, $80,000 today. I don't get any coupon payments for 10 years. The bond, you know, it just kind of smoothly rises in price because we're getting closer and closer to the maturity date. And then on the maturity date in 10 years, uh, what happens is that the issuer uh, hands me my $100,000 and then I go out to the backyard and I lay my $100,000 out there and I tell the uh, construction people, well, here's your 100,000, build me my swimming pool. Note, note that the immunization means that I know, that I know that I'm gonna have $100,000 in 10 years. I'm not gonna have 105,000, I'm not gonna have 72,000, I'm gonna have $100,000. Now, let me go ahead and put my hands over my head. This is what my grandson does. He goes, uh-oh, puts his hand there. Now, of course, you need to worry about, all we're talking about here is interest rate risk. We need to worry about default risk. So if that's a treasury bond, then I don't have anything to worry about because there's, no, uh, there's no default possibility of default on a treasury security. But if I buy a bond that was issued by Jim's construction company, then I, I might have to worry about that. So remember this, our focus here is on managing interest rate risk. Managing default risk, that's a topic for another story. All right, back to uh, Macaulay duration. I think I said many things on this slide already. Weighted average time to maturity. The Macaulay duration of a zero coupon bond is the bond's maturity, which means that if there are coupon payments, that means that the Macaulay duration will be less than its maturity date. You know, for example, a 10 year bond might have a Macaulay duration of four years or five years of six years. And it depends on the coupon rate and it depends on the yield to maturity. Now I did give you this formula just kind of quickly. Did you notice I slipped it in uh, 10 minutes or so ago in order to modify, to make this modification, all you really need to do is take that Macaulay duration and divide by one plus uh, the yield to maturity on the bond. What we can do then is we can translate that into a dollar amount. So look at the definition of the money duration. It's the dollar sensitivity uh, of a change in yields, e either on the asset or the liability side. So there's a simple old equation. You probably remember this from level two. And I, you know what? I can't remember those of you who passed level one and level two and are now taking level three. I can't remember if this formula was included in, in level one two years ago. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. So all we do is take the duration of the bond times the market value, and then we can get that uh, basis point value one basis point, so there's uh, three zeros and a one. Now, are you ready for this? This is so important. I remember my uh, professors in college telling us how important this is. And when I say college, I always refer to my, my regular graduate school days. I got an MS in finance, and so my professors, you know, they emphasize this. When I got to graduate school for my PhD program, it was on a completely different level. But I remember my MS and my MBA professors, because I had to take a lot of MBA classes, um, would say something like this. Look, this immunization here, it relies on the simple fact that when there is a change in yield, that the entire, the entire yield curve changes by that same amount, right? A parallel shift in the yield curve. And I remember thinking, okay, that makes sense. Uh, is it important? How important is it? And, and does the yield curve shift in a parallel manner? 
And I remember my professor saying, you know, in a perfect world, it does, but we don't live in a perfect world. So we have to worry about twists and non-parallel shifts, which are way more common than a parallel shift. So if we have this yield curve that looks like this, and instead of having a parallel shift, it goes up like this, it goes like this, <laughs> you know, whatever I'm doing with my hands there, then it throws out all of that immunization. Um, and the elimination of interest rate risk from the previous 10 minutes of, of our discussion. And what I could do is I could show you an Excel spreadsheet where a twist or a non-parallel shift, you know, pretty much just uh, changes everything on the, uh, uh, in the spreadsheet. So what does that mean? That means that if I were to have bought several bonds, that have 15 and 20 and 30 years to maturity, but they all had durations of 10 to finance my $100,000 swimming pool in my backyard. That means that in 10 years, I might only have 92,000, I might only have 64,000, and I would have to go to my daughter and my children and my wife and say, oh, I was hoping to have a $100,000 swimming pool, you know, with a fountain and a diving board and ladders and, and slides and all sorts of cool things, now we just dig out there and we're just going to have a puddle. You know, that's that's what happens that when we have these twists and non-parallel shifts in the yield curve. Hmm. So notice that second diamond point there. This structural risk, meaning twists and non-parallel shifts, can be managed through portfolio allocations. And so remember what I said just a few moments ago about what we were doing about that variance there. So we're, we're going to try to decrease the dispersion of the possible outcomes in our bond portfolio so that in 10 years, maybe I'll have 101,000 or maybe I'll have 99,000, but I'll have a decrease in dispersion that's manageable. And we can do this, you know, a number of different ways. We can use a barbell portfolio or a bullet portfolio here. So let's go ahead and take a look at these. Notice bottom left uh, in orange barbell portfolio, bottom right uh, purple box bullet portfolio. Notice in the middle, we're trying to come up with an optimal immunized portfolio. Optimal doesn't mean that we're going to completely eliminate that exchange rate risk. So the barbell portfolio, you remember this from level one, we're going to buy a long-term bond and a short-term bond. And, you know, so with my example, with my swimming pool, maybe I buy a 20-year bond and a four-year bond, right? My maturity date was, or my, my construction date was 10 years. And so the idea, the idea is that the interest rate risk for both of those, which is high for the longer term bond and low for the shorter term bond, will have an exactly offsetting uh, conditions so that in 10 years, I'll have my $100,000. But the problem with the barbell portfolio is that there is a chance that there could be high dispersion. So I might have 110,000, I might have 90,000, but I still am narrowing in there. With the bullet portfolio, um, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to match that duration and get that dispersion down to zero. But once again, we might not have bonds available that have that duration with our given level of default risk <laughs> uh, again. You know, so bullet, barbell portfolios and bullet portfolios, boy, those are, those are good ways to do this. But let's go ahead and try to combine barbells and bullets into an optimal immunization portfolio strategy that minimizes dispersion. You see what happens on the barbell portfolio, we just pick some bonds. On the bullet portfolio, we just pick some bonds. But notice with optimization, we bring in, you know, dare I remind you of the great Harry Markowitz and how he uh, decided that we could have a minimum standard deviation for every level of risk. So now what we're trying to do in this optimal immunized portfolio is to minimize that dispersion at every payoff level. So, so that when I buy these bonds today, I'll say something like, you know what, I know that in 10 years I'm going to have this range, minimizing dispersion.
So let's go ahead and define that dispersion. It's a weighted variance of the time to receive all of those cash flows. And there's a way to do this. We can minimize the convexity with that equation down there in the, in the gray box. In the example, notice the LOS just tells us to evaluate, but in the reading, there's an actual example and that dispersion is really a weighted variance. And so we just take the duration plus the duration squared plus the dispersion and the example in the reading, I think it was 33 or something. And so, you know, that's, you know, you could think of it as a percent, but just uh, just throw in 33 or whatever number that the question stem gives you and then divide by, uh, you know, one plus an interest rate. So this one will be the cash flow yield because, and that should make perfect sense, that cash flow yield because we're trying to minimize the dispersion of what happens over here on the right hand side and what happens over here on the left hand side of the balance sheet. All right, so let's go ahead and finish up this part one with a handful of slides on how are we going to minimize. So we're going to do this a couple of ways, right? Cash flow, duration, use of a derivative, and then a contingent immunization. Notice that diamond point up there. We're going to focus on type one liabilities here. So cash flow matching. This is aimed at eliminating interest rate risk of a stream of liabilities. And all we're going to do is have this, you know, dedicated portfolio. Notice, notice what we put in this re, in this slide here: uh, high quality zero coupon or coupon paying bonds to closely match the timing. And so this is what I've been saying: not just with my zero coupon bond for my for my swimming pool, but but with if I have a bunch of uh, coupon paying bonds. Now here's a good illustration at the bottom. Notice we have asset cash flows and we have liability cash flows. And notice at the end there's that maturity payment, uh, the maturity payment out there. So those that's why those final cash flows are larger. And so this is really a picture of what I've been trying to illustrate uh, all along. How about duration matching here? We're going to match the money duration of the immunized portfolio with that of the liabilities. You know, so those multiple liabilities are going to follow similar rules to a single liability. But instead of just having my hundred thousand dollars swimming pool, maybe I want to maybe I want to buy a swimming pool for everybody in my family so I can swim in peace out in my backyard. So I buy a swimming pool for my daughter. I buy a swimming pool for my son. But I do it in year eight and year nine and year 11. I do it in all those different kinds of time frames. So I probably have to consider all those rules. But the simple way to solve this problem is by evaluating them as if they were individual zero coupon events. A uh, couple of suggestions down there in the purple and in the orange. The initial investment should be equal to or exceed the present value of the liabilities. This goes against my first example. What did I say? 96, that got us to 100. But I was just assuming that that 96 was probably a risk free. So that's probably one way to handle it. But the Institute is in, is leading us into the next set of LOSs so that if we make that initial investment, so I would have bought a bond for $100. And as that that zero coupon bond would have just stayed flat in value, I wouldn't have earned any rate of return. You see the problem with that zero coupon bond, but it goes away. It goes away when we have coupon paying bonds. That, that should make perfect sense. So we probably need to worry about convexity as well. Now, single liability, we can just use that orange uh, arrow, Macaulay duration. And then with multiple liabilities, we're going to use the money duration. So that's probably important to remember. Uh, my simple example in the beginning and then money durations for multiple liabilities. And then, of course, we know this from level one a little bit. Level two, massive amounts and level three, right? And we've done some derivatives uh, slide decks as well. You can do you can use derivative securities to go ahead and immunize these single or multiple liabilities. So we're probably going to use an interest rate futures contract. Uh, there's a good old uh, gray boxed formula number of futures contracts. The Institute likes to ask questions on go ahead and compute the number of futures contracts, at least inside of the readings. And this is just a super simple one here. It uses a similar formula that we've used all along. Take the liabilities, uh, take the asset uh, and those basis points and divide by, you know, whatever happens in 
the derivative market. In this case, it will be the futures uh, basis point value. So I imagine if the Institute asked you to compute the number of futures contracts, even though the LOS doesn't ask us to demonstrate or calculate or compute, it would give you, you know, those simple uh, three input variables. So you would just have to subtract uh, and then divide. Now in the green and the red, of course, if the number of futures contracts turns out to be positive, that means we'll take the long position. If the number of futures contracts turns out to be negative, that means that we'll go ahead and take the short position. But look, look in the very bottom sentence on each one over there, we're trying to increase or we're trying to decrease uh, that money duration, whether we take the long or the short position. So I think that's probably a more likely question than to compute the number of futures contracts. I'm guessing that somewhere in the question stem, the Institute would say something like, okay, here we have this stuff up here. We're going to use a derivative overlay and the number of futures contracts is a plus 16 or something. And then the question would be, well, you know, what's going on? And you would say, oh yes, we want to increase the money duration of our assets to match uh, the liability over on the right hand side of the balance sheet. That sounds like a much better question. Uh, now, remember what I just said a moment ago about uh, this idea of buying $100 to finance $100 in liabilities, if the value of that $100 goes up to, let's say, 105 before the liability comes due, we have a surplus. So what do we do with that $5? We still have 100 right? And we owe 100 so that's taken care of. But then what do we do? We have this surplus and that's when, that's when we bring in this concept of active management. What we would like to do is take that $5 in my example and turn it into $10 or $20 or $50, right? So we're going to actively manage this surplus. So when is active management appropriate? when the surplus is above a certain level. So in my example, you know, I might have said, you know, in the policy statement, it would say, hey, if, the, if there's ever a surplus of two, then you can manage anything in excess of two. So when I had a five, five minus two is three, we could actively manage that, uh, that, that three. And this, of course, applies to everything that we did back in equities uh, and even some alternative investments, you know, maybe like hedge funds. But look at the bottom there, when active management fails and the surplus decreases, then we need to go back to passive management. Let's go ahead and quickly talk about uh, liquidity. Liquidity is important for both the passive or the initial bond investment, but it's super important for these actively managed portfolios because what do we know? Yields go up, yields go down. So if we have a dramatic increase in the yield, uh, we may have to unwind our position. So when are we going to do this? Look at the red and the blue. We'll over hedge if yields are expected to decline. We'll under hedge uh, in the other direction. Here's just another picture of a laddered portfolio and how it shows time diversification. Benefits of a ladder diversification. There we go. Time diversification. I'm sorry. Benefits of a laddered portfolio, time diversification, overall portfolio uh, duration maintenance. Uh, it gives us um, a better ability to manage reinvestment rate risk because there's less cash flow. And we have this laddered uh, uh, portfolio that probably has much more liquidity. And that takes us for, through the first LOSs. Um, there are about 30 some problems at the end of this reading. I'm going to go ahead and say, just pause. Wait till you watch the uh, second part of this slide deck, and then I'll call your attention to some really good problems at the end of the reading. So uh, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.